And here is this week's installment of Ezekiel Craylin's story about the dogs. Generally, mostly. Can I visit you for a minute? Shudder is the title. Ezekiel Craylin wrote, Email posts from December 15th to the 20th. Re-awesome meetup. Watson wrote, He's going to sue the fuck out of you. What a blast of hot, fetid, empty air. I replied, well, he didn't break out into a tirade until I asked him if he has anything else to complain about. I don't think he was serious in the least. Watson wrote, he sure can't turn on a dime, can't he? Pleasant and reasonable one minute, vicious and nasty the next. I replied, I am under the impression that's the kind of people he grew up with, both family and community-wise. Typical ghetto life. Watson wrote, Tell me more about Michael Savage. Sure, I could look him up, but I'd rather hear it from you. I replied, I already told you about him, but that was many years ago when Deke first brought him up to harangue me. Savage is almost solely responsible for turning San Francisco into the hate talk capital of the country for almost four years. It was back in the mid-90s when KSFO switched to hate talk radio format as Clear Channel and Cumulus began gobbling up independent stations across the continent and turning them into right-wing propaganda mills. When Trump was president, he gave Mr. Savage a position on the Presidio Trust Board of Directors. He is one of the hate talk radio pioneers, like Rush Limbaugh and to the Bay Area's misfortune resides in Tiburon, his radio show out of San Francisco, poisoned many of the homeless against liberals and LGBTs. You could hear them parroting his hatred as they acted out on the streets. Of course, his show also poisoned the minds of many low-income, poorly educated residents as well. Savage constantly vilified gays, the homeless, the poor, you name it. And he's still very popular. He may be Jewish, but he's a Nazi through and through. Watson wrote, Housing is definitely a basic human right, along with a guaranteed income and health care, and this country is rich enough to provide for every single citizen. Nobody should be cold, hungry, homeless. Imagine the Eden this earth could be. I replied, You're preaching to the choir here. I wish I had a strong arm to force Deke to sit down, shut up, and listen to me. Re awesome meetup. Watson wrote, Ah, yes, I remember now. The cruel irony of recruiting homeless people to the right-wing cause is truly mind-blowing. Savage, in fact. I replied, I even lost a good friend who was houseless, thanks to savage, bigoted rants. That was Johnny, who, after his father suddenly passed away, began showering me with hatred, using many verbatim quotes from Savage's radio show, including the term Psychobabbling Lefty. Can you believe that Apple Incorporated includes him in their podcast library? This media feeding of right-wing propaganda to the homeless, the poor, the unemployed, and the stupid and poorly educated is right out of the Nazi playbook, which is how the brown shirts came into being, Hitler offering the desperate citizens employment to do his dirty work. All we need is a similar strategy by the right wing to accomplish the same horrific outcome. I'm sure they have every intention of doing just that. I predicted an anti-LGBT pogrom as a result of President Clinton's DOMA and DADT policies because it emboldened the hateful right to attack queers with ferocity. So now we're very close to my prediction. It is therefore quite obvious at this point that sexual minorities will soon be persecuted as national policy. Most folks don't know that all, or at least most, of the books burnt by Nazi Germany were from libraries of the Institute of Sexology, of which homosexuality was a major topic, and a positive light, I should add. Subject, Jebus Freak Psychopaths Inside the Castro, 17-second video. Caption, a march of this type hasn't happened in years. No doubt they feel emboldened by right-wing Christo, Christo fascist terrorism sweeping the sorry nation. I hate to say it, but I doubt it's going to stop here. Not by a long shot. In fact, San Francisco is likely to become the main and first target of homophobic troglodyte attacks, violence, and smashing of windows, especially gay bars. Fasten your seatbelt, it's going to be a bumpy pogrom. 
such as the price we pay for allowing free speech to include excessive and vitriolic bigotry that obviously foments violence and persecution, and for allowing the churches to play a major role in shaping our laws. Separation of church and state, my ass. It's never been that way. It's a ruse. Subject, four new doggy jackets. During the end of this morning's meetup, he told me, Hold on, I have four jackets to give you. I thought he meant he held on to the jackets I recently gave him over the past two weeks, but assumed he lost them as he usually does. So I, my first reaction was to be impressed that he managed to keep them, and now I could wash them for later use. But no, they were all new jackets, he said, were donated by a pup-friendly group called the Wolf Pack, but I can't find them on the web. You'd think he'd bother to hold on to the doggy attire I give him, but alas, he seems to enjoy wasting my money, thanks to his carelessness or whatever it is, jealousy of how much the pooches love me, resentment that I can't provide them sanctuary anymore. I gave him three sweaters and two jackets in just two weeks' passage from late November into December. The rainy season is always more expensive for me because Deke is mostly irresponsible for any number of reasons, including allowing the contents of his cart to get soaking wet rather than protect them with a cover, such as two large plastic trash bags of which I always keep a supply, though I must admit he has been keeping the carts dry of late. That's a hopeful sign. On another good note, he's taking better care of the hounds providing them warmth with a supply of comfy material and keeping their sweaters and jackets on for a change. Last night he was with some young woman who is nicely dressed, friendly, and loves the pups, who seems, who seemed to love her back. Flacco was sitting in her lap when I stepped out to return Deke's electronics. I believe she is homeless, but may have places to stay with friends, shelters, whatever. Deke seems comfortable and happy in her presence. So I hope this may lead to a friendship where she will encourage him to take better care of the doggies. He did throw a minor hissy fit this morning over yet another speaker I was charging for him. The details of his tantrum are irrelevant. Suffice it to say, it barely lasted a minute, and he was otherwise thoughtful and polite to me during both last night and today's get-together. He even offered me a thick sheath of papers he found on his walks. They're legal documents. I thought you might like to read them, he explained. Oh, thanks. Thoughtful of you, I replied. But I'm going to turn it down as I already read tons of printed material on the Internet. I now regret not accepting them because I later realized he was gifting me with something and it would have been better to graciously receive them no matter I'd toss them out shortly thereafter once he's departed. And Now some bad news. Scooter's back with a vengeance the past two weeks or so hollering up Carlson's window with angry threats and shrill, ear-splitting whistles in an attempt to summon him outside. Always at night time and sometimes very late, disturbing my sleep and no doubt that of others living here, though no one bothers to stick their head out and tell him to shut up. For the past several days, he seems upset that Carlson either broke his phone or gave him the wrong one. I suspect, however, from the little that I've heard of his bellowing, that it all boils down to neither party understanding the basics of how phones work, which is also Deke's problem and source of more than half his explosive rants. One night, he even threatened to force himself inside and pound on Carlson's door until he opens it, upon which he started to kick the front gate and bang on it with his fists for a few minutes, around 3.30 a.m., this doesn't happen every night, thank the Druids, but has been going on every two or three nights over the past two weeks, though sometimes two nights in a row, so I have to curtail the moments I step outside to avoid the skunk, and I can't enjoy looking out the window as much or as long as I'd like anymore. For he does look up at my window now and then. All I need is for him to start hollering up at me too, for he does know my name, thanks to my being so foolish as to think Carlson was a nice guy when he moved in, and about two years later introduced me to Scooter outside by Café Flore when it still had benches. Often I see him standing across the street, usually partly concealed behind a black lamppost, looking up at Carlson's window and sometimes whistling, loitering at the streetcar island or bus stop, and sometimes even hanging around right below my window because it's an inviting location thanks to the old ATM nook now boarded off where you won't be standing in front of a shop's doorway. Between Scooter, Deke, the building manager, obnoxious residents, and certain folks outside, I sometimes wonder, what am I, a stupidity magnet? Subject, the friendly firemen and Deke's late meetup. 
Two afternoons ago, I walked down to the lobby to retrieve an Amazon delivery, but who should be at the front gate but several firemen? They did not seem to be in a hurry when I opened the gate to let them in and said, I'm not the one who called, but come on in. They said, thank you. And one held the gate open. Stepping out? Nope, I replied. I just came downstairs to pick up, and then I pointed at two items set down on the glass table to my right, my packages from Amazon. With that, one of the firemen grinned, because I guess my simple plan to pick up my deliveries was thwarted by their arrival, while two others clambered up the stairs with a lengthening trail of measuring tape starting from the doorway. There were soon all four of them on the second floor, as I followed upstairs with two packages under my left arm, careful not to get my feet tangled in the yellow strip, and as I approached my floor, saw they had extended it all the way down the west end of the hallway and around the corner towards, guess who, Carlson's abode. Since the jerks moved in almost three years back, he has had firemen and or an ambulance show up to assist him for whatever supposedly urgent reason numerous times per year. What bullshit is he up to now, I thought, as I nodded kindly to a couple of firemen before proceeding to my hovel. Of course, I was highly curious as to what brought them here this time, but no way was I going to be a nuisance and appear before them just to find out what's up. So I stood in the alcove right beside my room, where they wouldn't see me, and tried to eavesdrop. However, it was difficult to make out anything they said. Nor did I hear Carlson's voice. Their walkie-talkie crackled a lot with voices and static, but provided no pertinent revelation for the situation at hand. Though, when another resident came down the stairs some minutes later, I heard him ask if everything's all right. Yes, said one of the firemen, this is just a practice run. Practice run, Watson? You mean they're using our building for some kind of rehearsal? Did they do this with other old large apartment buildings in their district? Or maybe Carlson's become so notorious at this point they wanted to prepare for any future emergencies he may conjure up. Else why would the measuring tape end right before his apartment instead of down some other side hallway, like where my deceased quasi-fascist neighbor used to reside? I can only think of one reason for the measuring tape to record the required fire hose length to the bohemian tards locusts, what the fuck do they think might happen? The genial firefighters departed a few minutes later, but I was no more the wiser. At least yesterday evening when Scooter showed up again and lingered around my building, he made no disturbance, not even a whistle, and disappeared within a few minutes. So last night I crashed out just after midnight, but barely 15 minutes later, Deke called up to me. I just need you to charge some stuff overnight. By now, the dogs know to gaze up my window whenever their master stops below, even if they're parked by the bus stop. So now all three look up at me these days, instead of just one stupid who-man. The doggies' sweet little faces staring up at me with such devotion breaks my heart, because I can't bring them inside. When I stepped out to pick up his devices, of course I showered the pups with beloved regard, and they drank it all up, curly tails wagging, uh, vivace, with Flacco licking my face and her brother gnawing on my shirt in happy mischief. So when I collected the gizmos, I thought to return back downstairs to spend a few more delightful minutes with my brindle kin, but Deke popped that bubble. Can I visit you for a minute? I simply said no, and walked toward the gate, realizing if I came back outside, he'd pester me further and ruin my doggy interlude, besides which I can't even imagine the cruelty of leaving the hounds outside while they watch me enter the building with their master. On the positive side, he only asked me once and did not push it and was otherwise polite and calm. As I began to write this missive, I had to pause because he showed up to retrieve his gadgets, was peaceful in demeanor, and asked only that I serve the doggies breakfast, bring them water and a cup of soda for him. Then he said he's got to go. He may harbor resentment toward me for no longer sheltering the hounds, but I didn't sense any hateful vibes, nor were his words anything but kind. He did ask, when is Christmas again, like he did two days ago, so I reminded him it's this Sunday. Sunday, he queried. Does everyone else around here know it's Sunday? Strange question, I thought, but I simply answered, I'm sure they do. His shopping cart was loaded with a mountain of unknown contents because covered by a drop cloth, and Five lawn-sized trash bags bulging with dented cans and empty bottles tied to it on all sides except along the handlebars. 
Wow, I remarked as he turned the cart around toward Noe Street, tethered pooches in tow. That looks damn heavy, Dick. I don't see how you do it, but I'm sure it keeps you strong. So off they went. A homeless rogue and his two angelic furries. They all looked healthy and in good spirits, glad to report. Nice words are good reinforcement for nice behavior, eh, good doctor?' 